Good morning, church. We're excited to worship with you today. I'm going to invite you to stand if you can. We're going to start this morning by lifting up a song called Battle Belongs. This is all about trials that we might come up against. And, and just digging into the fact that regardless of what those are, he is for us, he is with us. Let's sing this morning.
Space between what remains of me and this reckoning. Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know, and I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the water holding.
can go ahead and have a seat. We're going to transition a little bit here, and we're going to go into a time of offering uh, in preparation to hear and receive the word that God has for us this morning. But first, though we don't do the act of offering together, um, I think it's still important that we kind of take a second and try to gear our hearts to be receptive of this as an act of worship. So I'm going to ask that you pray with me. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be together this morning, to celebrate you, to celebrate your presence and your worthiness. Regardless of if we're in this room or at our homes this morning, I pray that you can help us to be worshipful givers this morning. us to be receptive of your presence this morning. And God, as we open up the word, I pray that you can just help us to have open ears, open hearts, and understand that you are working this morning. So God, we ask you to work in us. We thank you for this place. We thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Glad to see everybody here. Those online, thanks for tuning in and being with us here this morning as well. If you're visiting here with us uh, for the first time, we encourage you to stop by our Next Step station and, and uh, get a little gift that we have for you and find out some information. If you want to know more about the church, you're watching online, uh, just go to our website and uh, williamsvillecc.com and you can find out about what we have going on here and the different things that are happening. But I, I'm glad you're all here. You tuned in and everybody's here. We're getting the second part of our fall campaign called Brand New by Andy Stanley. Uh, I, I love this time of years we do this campaign and the challenges that we learn from it together as a church our small groups are learning and going over and reviewing and because repetition helps us remember and, and and I love it and and again just to remind you and let you know how we end uh, this series the last Sunday or not the last Sunday the fourth Sunday in October we have what's called service Sunday here where we we gather, but we don't gather at our church times and sit in here. We gather here about 8 a.m., and uh, we have projects that we've already got lined up and, and everything, and then we send the people out, we work, we come back here, and at noon we have a potluck, and we share in that together and, and have a time of celebration of how God used us that day. So some of you may have already been receiving the calls from our staff saying, hey, how can you be a part of that? What can you do to help? How would you like to help? What are your gifts, talents, abilities, the way you like to use them that day? And, and so we're going to continue contacting you or reaching reaching out to you uh, uh, if you haven't uh, uh, already heard from us uh, about that. If you have, if you've gotten an email, if you've gotten a text, if you've gotten a phone call and haven't answered, uh, go ahead because they're going to be bugging you again this week and, you know, ultimately we know where you live. Okay, and so, uh, you know, we'll come out and we want to talk. It's, it's a great day, it's a great Sunday, and we, and we love that. And I also wanted to let you know that uh, so tomorrow we're going to send out our quarterly newsletter. And if you have not been receiving email updates or our newsletter or anything along those lines, again, stop at our Next Step station and make sure, give them your phone number, give them, give them your email and all that to make sure we have it correct that, and that it's been uh, entered into it correctly so we can be communicating with you all that's going on and, and how God is using us definitely. But like I said, I'm glad that you're here in this series. Um, this is a good series. This is a challenging series uh, uh, on what we're going through and what we're doing. If you didn't get last week, I encourage you to go back online and watch it. There was so much information. I'm just going to touch a real quick review to kind of put us to where we are, what we learned, what Paul taught. Um, we, Paul taught about Christ when he came and, and he brought something brand new. <clears throat> That's what it's about. He brought something brand new. And, and, and it wasn't that he brought in Judaism 201 or 2.0. This was something that was completely different and it confused the people. It angered the people. It frustrated the people. And for us, 2,000 years later, when we read through the scriptures, it's kind of hard for us to understand, uh, but if we're not careful, the same thing can happen to us today that happened to them and was happening to them. And what Paul called, or what Andy called, excuse me, uh, what Paul was trying to teach 
Andy called it the temple model that they were bringing in. And the temple model's been around forever. We still have the temple model today. It doesn't matter what religion and everything that you practice, where you practice, or what denomination. The temple model is basically made up of four things that we learned. It's this big sacred place, or it doesn't have to be big, but it's this place that's sacred, you know, that you go in this holy of holies, you know, that you have. And in that sacred place are sacred texts. You know, that, that could be oracle, could be written out, could be whatever that is. But there's these sacred texts that these sacred people, they interpret, they study and they interpret. And then they teach the sincere people about how they should live their lives and what that should look like. And, and, and Paul's saying, you know, this temple model, that, that, that was, oh, that's done away with. That's not anymore. When Christ came and, and, and that he established what he called a brand new covenant. That temple model was under the old covenant. They're familiar with covenants. They had this covenant with God, the old covenant. They knew what covenants meant and what it was, and they were familiar with that. But Jesus brought a brand new covenant, and it had a brand new command that came with it. And this command was going to, this one command was going to take precedent over all other commands, which would bring a brand new ethic, which we're going to spend most of our time talking about here today, and start a brand new movement. And so in the early days, you had these Gentiles and even the Jews, they were loving what they were hearing about Christ and who he is and the truth and and what he had set up and what he wanted to be, the ecclesia or the gathering at that time, his people to be out there. But the Jewish Christians in that first century had a very specific tension that they had to try to manage, a very specific tension that made it difficult for them, which I think we could understand. They had a hard time letting go of the old traditions. I mean, we still struggle with that in the church. What do you hear? And even not even in the church, but you can even hear it in, the, in businesses and stuff. You know, when you go to present a new idea, somebody says what? We've never... Yeah, okay, some of you work, and some of you have been in church. Yeah, we've never done it that way before, meaning why would we do that? This is, we've done this for a thousand years, this tradition. It was almost like it was disrespectful or even sacrilegious for them to for, think about not even doing any of that stuff anymore. And the reason we struggle with that is, is simply something we're going to be learning in the next couple of weeks. So I encourage you to continue to be a part and follow this and be here. But it's a struggle because our conscience determines religious realities, whether they reflect reality or not. Let me say that again. Our conscious thoughts, they determine our religious realities, whether they reflect reality or not. See, have you ever had anybody say something to you like, you know, you really shouldn't feel that way? Try saying that if you're married and you're in an argument. You know, honey, you really shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> you're going to find out a whole lot more about how they're feeling, you know, or this, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're struggling with doubt and they say, well, you know, or guilt, you shouldn't feel guilty. Now, when someone says to you, you shouldn't feel guilty, does the guilt automatically go away? No, it doesn't. Why? Because our conscience has been fine-tuned to a certain set of values, and right or wrong, you have those values, so that's why you feel guilty. And until you understand those values and correct the wrong ones and everything, that guilt stays there. I mean, you ever been in a situation where you've been with your friends? you got good friends. You're good people, good friends. You know, you're out with them. And all of a sudden, your group of friends, they do something or they say something, and you're uncomfortable? Whoa, I can't believe they said that. Or I can't believe they did that. Or I can't believe they want to go do that. It makes you feel uncomfortable. Or maybe you've been the one (laughs) that's done or said something that's made your group of friends feel uncomfortable. Why? Because, like I said, our conscience, uh, they're fine-tuned to a certain set of values. And oftentimes, that's what we experience as religion. As many of you know, I grew up in the Catholic Church and, 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 uh, I uh, had many, many Catholic friends, and m- several of you grew up in the Catholic Church as well. And that, But one of the things that I always struggled with in the Catholic Church that they would have us do was confession. I didn't understand why we had to go and confess to this guy that I only saw on Sunday, you know, and, and, and I just didn't understand that. I would ask in catechism class, CCD they called it, you know, and, and, and my teachers and my other friends was like, well, that's just what we do as a good Catholic. I didn't, I mean, I remember one time I didn't want to go and my dad, uh, you, you know, I don't know if my dad remembers this, but my, my, my dad, you know, he was sitting there and it's like, dad, I don't want to go to confession. He says, well, we're going to confession. I don't want to go this month. Well, we're going, you know, you can hear the kid whining. I was in junior high. I don't want to go. And uh, so, you know, dad smartly said, you know, why? And I said, because I haven't done anything since the last time I was in there wrong. Dad said, cool, tell the priest that. (laughs) 
he knew what he was setting me up for. So I thought, awesome. So I go in and I do what you do. You know, you kneel down, you know, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been so many months since my last confession or so long since my last confession. I've done nothing wrong. And the priest began to list every single sin known to man, defined every single sin known to man, asked me if I committed. I don't know what decade I got out of there, but I was in there longer than I'd ever been in my life. But I just couldn't understand confession, why we needed to do that. And every denomination has something that, I mean, I had a lot of Baptist friends, you know, and I remember the Baptist, we don't drink, huh? We don't drink. What? Why? Well, you're not supposed to drink. Why? Oh, yeah. If there's a store selling alcohol, we drive five miles around it because you just don't drink. It's like, well, dude, we got it. We have wine in our church. What? You know, every church has its way and has its things that maybe we don't understand because of the way that you're raised and stuff like that. The way that religion is presented to you, it fine tunes your conscience. And that's why some of this that we go through this might be extremely difficult for you to hear, accept, believe, or whatever because of that. So here's what happened. The early Jewish Christians, they attempted to assimilate the Jesus model into the temple model. It's like, okay, here's Jesus. He's the Messiah. We give you that. But he was also a Jew. And, and he was raised and taught and, and schooled in this Old Testament laws and teaching. So since that's his heritage, we can just blend that. We can just bring that right together with his new teachings and blend it all together and have our happy-go-lucky church that's there. And thankfully, Paul comes along and Paul says, no, 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 no. Let me set you straight on how bad of an idea that that is. And remember, when Paul first came on the scene, you know, Paul wasn't the man that we know that wrote most of the New Testament. Okay, Paul was known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee, called himself the best of the Pharisees. You know, he hated the church. He hated Christians. And his type A personality, he was going to wipe them off. And he got permission, and that's what he was set out to do. I'm going out, and you're either going to deny or die. That's how it is. Deny Christ or die. I'm done with it. The church is over. I'm going to get rid of it. And thankfully, he had his conversion to Christianity. And then he turned around and was able to start teaching the truth about Christ and who it is. And I don't think there's a better person than Paul that understood and knew the danger of trying to bring and blend in that temple model with Jesus model and, and, and the problems it would have. And so Paul's out on, he's on his first missionary journey. He goes to this area called Galatia. And he's teaching to these Gentiles there and some Jews that are there, and they hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus, who Jesus is, how much he loves them, what God has done through his son Jesus, and they love it and they accept it. And they're starting these little gatherings and these little congregations are getting together. They're inviting other people to come and other people are hearing the truth. They're accepting and it's growth, 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 and all this is happening and it gets to a point where Paul feels comfortable that he has to continue on his missionary journey and go to other places and so he leaves. But then behind him come these other missionaries. These are Jews that have become Christians. And they're like, oh, yeah, what well, Paul taught you about Jesus, good stuff. He forgot to tell you, though, in order to really become a Christian, you first have to convert to Judaism. You have to become a Jew. And, of course, this is that old temple thought. These law, it, it's bringing, and it's confusing. It's confusing. And really, it's really confusing to the guys, okay? Because they're teaching, you've got to become a Jew. You have to convert to a Jew. And for the guy, for the Gentile growing up man, that meant he had to undergo a surgical procedure, okay? And so they're hearing all this good news about Jesus. I'm loving Jesus. I'm loving what Jesus... Did. That's that surgery thing that's kind of holding me back, you know, and that I got to have. And these Jews are teaching, no, 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 that's okay. Jesus gave his life for you. He gave everything. At least you could do is go through a a little bit of a surgery, and Paul heard this teaching, and Paul heard what was going on, and Paul got upset. Actually, the word there on your handout, if you got an outline with it that you're following and going over, uh, it's not a misspelling. Some people said, I think you misspelled a word. It's not. I do that all the time, but I'm pretty sure that, well, I know this one isn't, uh, and that it's apoletic, all right? Apoletic. It is a very, it's a word we don't use hardly at all and stuff, but it, it, it is more than just a righteous anger. It's a righteous anger there, but it, it's talking about and sharing a degree of anger, a high degree of frustration slash anger that Paul had about this teaching that was happening here, this whole thing that was going on. And he says, let me walk you through some truth. And so in Galatians chapter five, this is what he says very passionately to the people you'll hear. He said in verse, the first part of verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And one of the things I like about Andy Standing is 
Andy Stanley and the study that he does here. He takes a point here and says something that, and maybe this is the whole reason God had you tune in online or brought you here today to at least hear this truth if you hear nothing else. You know, if, if our version, if your version of Christianity doesn't make you feel free, then you're probably doing it wrong. Okay, if your version and your experience of following Jesus isn't described with the word freedom in it, then there's probably something wrong with your version of Christianity. Because Paul says it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Don't don't find yourself under the weight of all that Old Testament laws and regulations and rules that were there. And and he says this in verse two, mark my word. Now, when you see that on the screen, you see the exclamation point. In the Greek language, they have no punctuation. But the phrase, mark my words in Greek, is such a strong phrase that those that, when they were interpreting the Greek over into the English, realized we would just read past that and not understand how strongly Paul is emphasizing it. And so they put the exclamation there so we would know this is extremely important and Paul's passionate about this. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you have let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Wow. That's for no value. And I want you to understand something about this whole circumcision that we keep talking about. Paul's not against the process or the procedure or circumcision. Again, he was raised as a Jew. On the eighth day, he was circumcised. He has no issue with that. That wasn't the problem. The thing is that's important is Paul is not against the, like I said, the procedure of circumcision. Circumcision in the context that they're being taught represented the old covenant. And last week, what did we learn? Jesus came and fulfilled the old covenant. He did away with it and brought a brand new covenant. So Paul's saying, look it, as he's talking to these grown-up Gentile men, he's going, look, if you allow yourself to go through this surgery to be circumcised, you're embracing the old covenant, the old law, and you don't need that. That was a sign. That was a sign that the nation of Israel belonged exclusively in a unique way to God. That's no longer where we're at today in our relationship with God. And if you do that, Christ has no value. And in verse 3, he says, And again, I declare to you that every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Again, what were they trying to do? Here's this Old Testament, this New Testament, this temple way, Jesus way. Let's kind of sprinkle them together, get a little bit of Old Testament here, a little bit of New Testament here, and come together, and we'll all be happy. We'll all be happy, just kind of blended together. And Paul's like, no. Like, what's the big deal, Paul? We've had the Old Testament for thousands. Everybody, what's the big deal? And he's saying, well, if you think you got, all you have to do is be circumcised, and suddenly you get all the advantages of the old covenant, you're wrong. And see, that temple mold, that temple thought, that's still, when I say it's alive today, we still have that in the New Testament today. I mean, they thought all I have to do is go through the surgical procedure and I get all the blessings and benefits that's taught in the Old Testament. Paul said, no. It's just like what I would say to you and teach to you today. You know, we we believe you, you, you pray a sinner's prayer or you enter the water of baptism, come up and you're saved and that's it. You can go out and do whatever you want now the rest of your life because you're good, you're in at heaven. And Paul, if he was standing here, would say, nope, nope, that that's not what that means either. Don't kid yourself, Paul's trying to tell him. If you decide to get circumcised, you're under the whole law. You got to do all the dress right, the, the walk right, the eat right. You remember the Sabbath? You better keep in those 613 laws. You either have it all or none of it. And God launched this new, this brand new way, this new covenant. And he tells us in verse four, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated. You've been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. And I love Andy's illustration that he gives with grace. Uh, It's like this. It's like after we got done with the service here, our second service, if one of you all came up to Melinda and I and the kids and said, hey, we really like you guys and love you guys and appreciate you guys and what you've been here and and that. And so we want to bless you and give you this gift uh, of this, you know, this gift card to go to this restaurant, Taco Bell, okay? Now, for some of you, that's not a gift. (laughs) I understand that, you know, but since I'm the one choosing Taco Bell. All right. So you give me this hundred dollar gift card to Taco Bell. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's just too much. 
let me give you something for the gift card. I mean, let me at least give you $50 for the gift card. And you're like, no, Beals, you're not getting it. It's a gift to you. It's a gift card. No, you don't get any. And so I'm like, I understand. I really appreciate it. And we talk a little bit longer. And I say, okay, how about this? What if I just give you $25? Because that, that's just too much. Let me give you $25 for the gift card. And I keep on, you keep. Finally, you break down and you say, fine, that's, give me $25 to the gift card. At that point, it is no longer a gift card. It is now a discount card. I have completely taken gift out of the title. And that's what Paul is trying to help us understand. When we decide that we're going to compare or we're going to bring in the Old Testament in with Christ's teachings and sprinkle them together, we completely remove grace. We're taking it out, the gift of grace, because grace is God knew everything about us. He knew how bad of a people, if you will, if you want to go there, that we were, but yet he still sent his son Jesus to die for us. That's, how, that's grace. That's how much he loves us. Those of you that have given your life to Christ and are following and have made mistakes, he knows. He knows exactly every thought that you have. He knows exactly every mistake that you have. Even though you might be the only one that knows it, he knows it. He knows the bad, the good, the, he knows all of that, and yet he still loves you. He still loves you. That is grace. We don't deserve it. You can't deserve it, all right? It's not even on the list. Grace is grace. And the moment you try to earn it, the moment that we start bargaining with God, you know, to earn our way, well, God, did you see, you know, I did this. Did, you saw what I did over here, so I'm forgiven, right, God? Because I did these good deeds, you know. I mean, I went and, and, and I went on that missions trip, God. Remember that? I went there, you know. And, and the moment that you think that you have offered God something so good that God goes, well, you're one of my favorite. The moment you've adopted that part of the system, you have fallen away from grace. You've fallen away from grace. And Paul says in verse 6, For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Again, Paul circumcised on the eighth day. He's saying, look it, I've been circumcised. That's not why Jesus loves me, why he died for me. You, you Gentiles, you're not. That's not why Jesus loves you and dies for you. It has nothing to do with it. And then he teaches them the most important thing. He says this, the only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is our faith expressing itself through its love. Having faith that I believe, that you believe, that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, that he died and on the third day he was buried, but he, or that he died and on the third day he rose from the grave. And he has given us a gift that we don't deserve, that we cannot pay for him to accept to have in our life. And he's given us this gift when we bring that in that we are to go and to love as he loved us. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Really? We got all those pages and that's one sentence? <laughs> we got the whole Bible I'm trying to... And one... Yeah, those other things are good details that it's there, but the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself. You know, all that the other stuff that represents circumcision, that whole temple model, and that, it doesn't do any good. And sadly, like I said, as we're going to continue to learn as we go through this series, and that, that whole temple model, we're still struggling, and it's still not doing the church any good today. God, how am I doing? God, how am I doing? How are we, God? It's a vertical thing, and that, that's not what our relationship is about. I, I love the quote that Andy, actually Andy quoted somebody else, I just don't remember who he quoted on this in, in, in his writing, but he said this, if someone will die for you, if someone loves you enough to die for you when you don't deserve it, they are for you. Stop worrying. You're fine. Start looking around because the only thing of value is how you treat other people, not how you treat God. God's fine. Amen. God's got this church. Amen. He has that. And this is a big deal. All right, because if your whole approach to God is, God, I hope we are good, that temple thinking, Paul says, then it's, it's over. And in verse 7, he says this, you were running such a good race. I was there, I was teaching, we were doing such good things together. The church was growing because you were inviting people, you were telling people about the love of Jesus, and there was growth and things were good. And he says, who cut in on you? Who kept you from obeying the truth? And then he shares this, a little yeast works through the whole batch. 
just a little bit, a tiny little bit of that temple model, a little bit of legalism, a little bit of gracelessness, a little bit of how am I doing. It only takes a small dose to ruin the truth of what God was trying to bring through his son, Jesus Christ, for us. I mean, Paul got all emotional about this. You know, like, Paul, whoa, okay, settle down, dude. Or I don't know if they said dude, but Paul, you're okay, settle down. I've got my way, they've got their way, all right? Let's just all hold hands across the aisle and sing kumbaya. We're different kinds of Christians. Some people are more traditional, some people appreciate more. It's just the different kinds of Christianity. And Paul looks at him and Paul says, no, there are not different kinds of Christianity. There is one and one only, exclamation point. There's only one way to live your life. And it's not a traditional, it's not a contemporary, it's not a temple. It's exactly the way that Jesus lived his life. It's the way he lived his life. And when I keep saying Paul was emotional, Paul really got upset. Paul, I mean, listen, this is what I'm talking about in verse 12. As for those agitators, the one that are trying to teach you have to be a Jew, as for those av- uh, agitators, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Oh, that got mean real quick, <laughs> didn't it? That got busy real quick. What's he trying to say there? Jeez, Paul, that's extreme. Paul's like, you don't understand what's at stake. That's why I say Paul, because Paul was this Jew, and he understood what the law did. He understood when the law came in and legalism and all this stuff came in. He, he lived that. He knew that. He taught that. He believed that. He was killing people for that. And when the truth of Christ came in that set him free, he completely understood what would happen if we were to try to bring just a little bit of yeast, that little bit of temple into the truth of what Christ was saying. Paul knew that leaders would become self-righteous because that's what always happens in a temple model. You know, you've got those sacred leaders that are interpreting those sacred texts and they're always able to keep the law, but oh, too bad for you. You know, if your faith would have been just a little bit stronger, you wouldn't have that issue. If you had given just a little bit more, prayed just a, you wouldn't be having that that issue. It gets self-righteous, which Paul gets concerned because that makes followers then become hypocrites when you got this legalism, because what we do is we have to basically dumb down the rules. We say things like, well, I don't think it really means that, you know. So we dumb down God's law until it's something that I'm comfortable living with and all those that are in my friend group are comfortable living with as well. Because remember, it used to be that, you know, it said, you heard it said that if a man commits adultery, that's not good. Jesus shows up and says, it's not good, but even somewhere, let me tell you how bad it is, even if a man lusts after another woman, he's committed adultery with her. It's hard. It's like, whoa, he raised the standard way up here that we could not reach. And Paul knew that ultimately then what would happen is the text would start to get manipulated to points where we would like it, where we would be comfortable with it, others would be comfortable with it, which then would lead to the bad part where people would be mistreated. You know, and I don't know if you've ever been mistreated by a church, ever had somebody pull a, put a rule, put a law, put some kind, of, uh, some kind of thing over love. Some kind of thing over love. But he continues and he says, here's the main thing in verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, he says, we're called to be free, okay? But you do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Wow. It's not about that ooey gooey, just do whatever you want to do because, you know, uh, that's not loving, you know? That's not loving. Again, we read over that passage, but hear what that says. But you do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another in love. See, when we hear read indulge in flesh, we think "Ah, I'm going out getting drunk all the time, you know, and all the doing drugs, drunk, you know, sleeping with whoever. We, we, We go to a pretty high level of indulging in flesh which we don't understand what he's actually saying there is anything that I put me, myself, and I before Christ, I am indulging in my flesh. I'm making my flesh what I want to do more important than what Christ has called, created, and asked me to do. I have indulged in my flesh. See the whole new meaning to that? It's not just the person that went out last night and decided to drink a little too much or a lot. You know? It's the person that saw this person right here that they could help. And they're like, no, I'm not comfortable with that. And they listened to their flesh not being comfortable and they indulged the flesh and didn't do what they needed to do. Serve one another humbly in 
love. Humbly in love. Paul's going, wow. And for sisters and brothers, you were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, here's how you use your freedom. He says this, you serve one another humbly in love. And he says the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how it's fulfilled. And this is really powerful because these people that were holding on to this temple law, they had the Old Testament. And the Old Testament's a book of Leviticus. And in the book of Leviticus, that's what Paul's quoting here to help them understand. They've had this truth all along. How many of you have seen The Wizard of Oz? Okay, good portion of us. Do you realize that movie could have been done in 12 minutes and we were made to sit through two hours of flying monkeys? Okay, I mean, think about this. Think about this, okay? There's a tornado. Dorothy gets hit on the head. She wakes up in the land of Oz. You got these little people that are running around there with it. She's got a scarecrow. You know, she, she's got uh, the tin man and she's got the lion and, and she's got these ruby red slippers that, that, that they're trying to get from her and everything, okay? From the very beginning, all she had to do was click her heels three times and she could have been in Kansas. 12 minutes, we're done and Ovi having popcorn watching another movie. But no, the whole time she had everything she needed to get back to Kansas. Kansas, but she didn't realize it. Paul says, the whole time we have had the truth. This is what we're supposed to do, but we did not realize it, and we can't bring that temple model back into this because we'll be no different than in the next several thousand years than we have been in these previous thousand years, not living the way that we are called and created to live, to deny the flesh and to serve one another in love. To serve one another in love. I mean, the way you love God is by loving your neighbor. I mean, that's our whole purpose statement. Love him, serve them, disciple all. That's what we're about. And one of the ways that we love him is by going out and serving those that are around us in our life. And this is what the church understood for the first three centuries and had great growth. But then all of a sudden, this temple model and these things kind of got in and it got messed up. We can't do it that way. And we're going to go on to that next week. So don't miss next week. But as we get ready to come before these elements up here, as we get ready to have our time of what we call communion and what these elements represent, as you get ready to come up and take the two cups and come back to your seat and thank God for his son Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us and, and the model of life that he gave us to follow, as you come and partake of that, we have two up here and two in the back when uh, when the music starts playing, you're free at any time that you want to get up and grab the two and come back to your seat. Um, as you're doing that, as you're remembering that and giving thanks, think about this. Can you imagine just for a moment how different our communities would be, how different maybe our nation would be if just the Christians decided there's really only one thing that matters. It's my faith in Christ manifesting itself in love for other people. See, I think if you're here today, if you're tuned in watching online and you've had a bad church experience, it hasn't because, been because the people of the church believed in Jesus. That was not your bad church experience. People don't resist church because we have a loyalty to Jesus. That's not why Christians are, are resisted. It's because of how we've treated other people. And Paul says, that's why you cannot mix it and mix and match. That's why you can't blend because the moment you begin to look at how you evaluate yourself with God, you take your eye off the people most important to your Heavenly Father. So what would it look like? Think about this during this time of communion. What would it look like this week if every single interaction, every single conversation, every single temptation we had this week, you asked this one simple question. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? Well, you know, somebody really needs to go tell him or somebody really needs to go tell her. But, you know, if I do it, you know, it could really cost me. Yeah, it could. But what does love require of you in that situation? Well, I don't like those kind of people. <laughs> it makes me so uncomfortable to be around those kind of people. I don't want to have anything to do with those kind of people. Okay, that's what your flesh is saying. But, but. What does love require of you to do with those people that God has placed in front of you? Because I believe if we just got honest and answered that question honestly and then did what love required of us, my friends, that would change not just your life, but everybody's life that your life intersects with. And my friends, this is not something that's new. 
This has been what God has tried to help us understand in our relationships with people from the time he has created us to right now today. So as we come before these elements, let's spend some time in prayer. And if you want to talk with somebody afterwards, if you're watching online and you want to give us a call because you have questions, feel free to. We have leadership here that would love to sit and continue to talk with you about this. But let's go before God right now. Father, thank you for that truth. Thank you for that love. Thank you for what we're about to partake in, what it represents for us, not just right now, but each and every day of our lives. We thank you for that kind of love, that modeling of Christ's life, Father God. And, and, and uh, Father, forgive us. Forgive us if we've tried to put a little bit of yeast in, a little bit of our thought, a little bit of that temple model as we've heard uh, has been said in, Father God, and, and, and forgetting what's most important, Lord. I pray, Father God, that as we take this time when we remember, your spirit will speak to our hearts and help us to understand, Lord. Help us to honestly answer that question. What does love require of me in this situation, in this conversation, in this temptation? What does love require of me, Father God? Thanks that we can have this time and remember and to celebrate and to give thanks. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song cause you are good
is good. In every situation, you are good. When we've come up against something that, that feels like we can't overcome it, you are good. When we feel desperate for any kind of direction, you are good. for us is good. So as we leave this place this morning, I pray that you help us to know that as truth. Let us not be confused by the day-to-day. -day. Let us fix our eyes and our hearts on you. Help us to find newness in Jesus this week. For your love. We thank you for your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, church, for being here this morning. We hope that you found a blessing. Have a great week.